Uh, I present you Mar uh, Marina Warner, who will talk to us today about, you will tell us. <laughs> yes, sorry. thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the goddess Fortuna uh, took me by the hand over 40 years ago and deposited me to work on and off in the Warburg Library here in London ever since. And this paper, for what it's worth, is offered in homage to the staff there who have unfailingly helped me as they help all students who come there, as well as to the spirit of its inspired and marvelous founder about whom we've heard so much. The crucial and unique structure of the library, its Borgesian mis en abîme circularity, mirrors a conception of thought in movement itself, while it prompts our synapses to connect and fire along other pathways. It offers an exemplum in the form of a physiological and architectural embodiment of the processes of inquiry, serendipity, and longed for epiphany. It's not a parable, but, a piece of, uh, but an architectural. Um, it's not a parable as in Lorraine Daston's exemplar that she told us on the first day, but a diagrammatic structure replicating those processes. Warburg was committed to pursuing the concept of movement as energy, as we've heard a great deal about, as frenzy and repose. And his opus engages profoundly with cultural passages and translations. Today, in times of dislocation and war, and ever more serious threats of further civil violence, um, confusion and violent hatreds, people are on the move, and with them, stories. Their own personal stories, and their culture's legacies. And in the plural encounters of these new diasporas, new narratives are constantly being formed, as in the productive polarities and proximities of Warburg's serpent ritual lecture, his thoughts about northern and southern European entanglements, and the vortices and shuffle of the Builder Atlas. I'm going to suggest, and this is entirely speculative, that through adopting certain underpinning structures as we arrange the narratives of our knowledge, we modify our relations with one another and with the stranger. I could say with Saussure, as invoked yesterday, I do not speak language, language speaks me. Or rather, I do not make structures, they make me. Hannah Arendt once said that, wrote, stories are a form of action. They are the way we insert ourselves into the human world. And the ability to produce stories is the way we become historical. I would modify this and say that the ability to produce stories is the way we become social. And that one of the ways we do this is by sharing the anxieties of the group. But stories are only partly the story they tell, the actual plot or characters. They also need a vehicle. It can be, as the Builder Atlas shows, an image, which can be anything from a photo of a sculpture to an ad in a newspaper. But to this end, I'm going to I'm going to explore beneath figuration and gesture and the character of the images to look at another, at another aspect, to look at their arrangement and the organizing principle. And to that end, I'm going to invoke the arabesque as a vehicle that consists of graphic signs of motion um, and is both a term in dance and an aesthetic term for sinuous efflorescence, efflorescence and its close progeny, crystalline modularity. The arabesque is above all a scrolling, unfolding line, a metamorphic meander, um, whose elements can be set one inside the other, honeycombed, labyrinthine, curling and spiraling. And there's a doodle in, um, or a sketch from uh, After the Antique, uh, which Didi Huberman uh, reproduces in his latest book. The uh, arabesque is often too intricate to be easily reproducible from memory, even though its rhythmic digressions seem to mimic doodling thought processes. Its passing patterns often come to an end only when it is confined by a border or a frame, and it strongly implies that otherwise these patterns would extend ad infinitum in space and time. The polarity of impetus and stasis, thesis and antithesis, the upward thrust of joy and the downward weight of despair, containment and boundlessness. As structure, arabesque offers a cartography of energy in the process of metamorphosis. It offers an alternative way of occupying a space, of tiling a plane. 
an enclosure that generates over its edges and denies enclosure and flows rather than demarcates. The shifting illusionistic surface is all-inclusive one way and all-absorptive. It's a rejection of entropy um, in itself. Italo Calvino describes the arabesque as a literary term when commenting on the 17th century Neapolitan courtier and writer of fairy tales, Giambattista Basile, who sets one tale inside the other within a storytelling frame in his cycle of mischievous tales called Il Pentamerone, which was published in 1636-7, to soon after the author's death. Calvino invokes Basile's Baroque style in his essay called The, Maps of, the Map of Metaphors, 1974, and he praises the Neapolitan's high-spirited bravura knotting and interlacing, his melee of proverbs, riddles, exclamations, jocular asides, arranged in extended, often list-making litanies that constantly mock their own pretensions to meaning. He underlines the way ornament belongs in the essential structure of this style, and he proposes a reading in which metaphors, rather than being considered an ornament that adorns the fundamental interweaving of plot, subplots, and narrative functions, moves them forward into the foreground as the true substance of the text, bordered by the decorative arabesque threadwork of fabulous vicissitudes. The dynamic is not so much in the details as the difference between the details and the major theme dissolves. Where is the margin? It is made to oscillate into the motif itself. The interstice flips into subject. And I think we see this a great deal in, in Bob Warburg's interest in the details. It flips into subject. Thinking about arabesque as a symbolic design, interacting with political arrangements of space and energy, involves extending the term beyond its usual range of meanings, when it tends to be confined, even pejoratively contained, by concepts of the decorative and the ornamental. But Abbe Warburg himself commented that hedonistic aesthetes can easily game the cheap flavors of an art-loving public when they explain this change of form by the greater sensuous appeal of far-sweeping decorative lines. And he dismissed this view and stated and said that the effect rises from life in its subterraneous roots. And he stresses, uh, he talks about gesture there, he stresses that they're coming from the engrams of suffering passion from extreme transports of emotion. But the abstract design, I think, also contributes to this, this, this subterraneous roots coming through. The arabesque under pressure from the need for significance can develop into a tangle, a deliberate and organized tangle, such as calligraphic and verbal cartouches. And as such, its metamorphoses approach the lattice, the net, and the web, and other phenomena that convey, convey almost infinite, infinite plenitude. At one pole, magical talismanic security is, conven is conveyed by this, an entrapment of the other, a quintessentially ambivalent state, rather like the World Wide Web itself, like Google, both benefit and both bane and benefit. I want to put to you that the processes we choose to adopt, to think with, matter to politics and ethics, as Warburg knew, when he writes in the intro to Mnemosyne, science that records experience, on the other hand, retains and passes on the rhythmical structure in which the monstra of the imagination become the decisive pointers to the future. Narratives move across borders without regard for border guards, in spite of differences of language. They're set in motion by historical disasters, as well as more peaceful dynamics, such as trade and conferences. They are carried across cultures, literally translated by gossip, performance, dance, masking, ritual, and other forms of expression that Warburg, with his curiosity about the breadth of culture in all its manifestations, explored, especially with his sympathetic curiosity with the Hopi. We are living through a time comparable in danger to the 30s, I fear, with rising conflicts rooted in racist prejudice and striving for survival access to resources. Warburg has emerged as a seer for contemporary thinkers about relations between different peoples and entanglements of cultures in modernity. On account of his eclecticism, his quasi-surrealist curiosity and wonder, and his comparative theoretical approach. During the celebrated lecture on the Hopi dances of the serpent ritual that he witnessed and took part in in some degree, um, uh, uh, 
Abhi Baba um, stated, the magic involves the apprehension arising from a wish of a future event only by means of figural mimicry. Um, some aspects of contemporary composition by artists in different media, including words, engage with critical tensions in the world. And uh, uh, Warburg, they take up Warburg's, Warburg's recognition of animism, his search for expressive and extreme ecstatic energy, and his fundamental interest in the manifestation of a body irreducible to meaning. And this is, that was uh, Philippe Alain Michaud, who unfortunately didn't come to the conference, um, but whose book I've read and admired. Um, contemporary, ca um, he's catalyzed his thought, Warburg's thought, has catalyzed contemporary practitioners. And in catalyzing this work, he continues to gain marked persuasive force in a chain reaction that has not yet reached its full effulgence. Joan Jonas was inspired by the story of Warburg's illness, as recorded in Michaud's book his talking to butterflies, his memories of the serpent ritual and other Hopi dances, and his rejection of the modern surrogates for the serpent, electricity. To create a long, and she's created a long, multi-layered, poetic reverie and installation performance piece called The Shape, The Scent, and The Feel of Things. This is a quotation from HD's wonderful account of her very brief analysis with Freud. Jonas's poetic meanders punctuated by percussion, sound, gesture, moving film and dance, and her lifetime of experiments with the potential of digital media, um, live, looping, and montage to raise ghosts, have given her work a powerful contemporary significance. Jonas herself rejects the label shaman in particular and dislikes invoking the language of myth and symbol in general. Yet, it seems to me that many of her processes share aspects with the shamanistic tradition and its methods and aims. In reanimation, and the title, of course, picks up very much what my, my predecessor was saying at this podium um, about re we are reawakening, re-energizing, Jonas kindles active powers in inert objects, in the soundscape she builds, in the elements she depicts, and the creatures she honors through her montage of sound visuals and gestures to compose a full scenario. One could say of her, as Seamus Heaney writes in his poem Station Island, then I thought of the tribe whose dances never fail, for they keep dancing till they sight the deer. Heaney's pilgrim self in the poem is seeking a triumphant conclusion of the quest. The deer, once sighted, will be killed, just as reindeer will be tracked and hunted by the Siberian Tungus after the shamans have danced all night in a trance state in order to meet and propitiate the creatures that sustain the life of their people. By contrast, when Jonas invokes natural forces, she conveys an acute sense of the need to safeguard them and the hope that the damage might be halted or even reversed. In her poetic, tragicomic, and elliptical way, she testifies to the melting ice caps, the disappearance of species, and the plunder of resources. She's also aware of our littleness and our human absurdity, and a current of wry humor always surfaces in her performances, sparking productive disruptions. She invokes futurity in a spirit of placatory hope, while the droll mood of her performances helps lift our mood, and indeed fulfills the promise of her title, in the case of reanimation. A similar yearning to know, and therefore ward off damage of what is to come, uh, in what is to come, fills a recent film piece by the artist Elizabeth Price, in this case an English artist, who won the Turner Prize in 20, 2012 for her archival film montages. In a, fiercely mournful, in a more fiercely mournful spirit than Jonas, Price is one of many contemporary artists who quarry archives, and she has recently created a restoration, the caps are intentional, that, that's the style she wants, entirely from materials found in the Ashmolean Museum stores in Oxford, manuscripts, photographs and drawings made on ancient archaeological digs, including Arthur Evans's at Cognosus in Crete. And set about, she, the whole fil, her whole film montage is set about with crashing waves of sound and huge red letter capital headlines to rise their life force again, the life force of the objects she's collected, to restore them. 
Using a wide screen format, she frequently splits the image into mirroring halves. This is much too compressed uh, um, horizontally. It, sh it should be very long and thin. Um, and piles one on another in dizzying accumulations. Um, many voti votive figurines of women were discovered and are in the museum, and each of them is broken. It's now thought that they were snapped in two to confirm a compact, such as a wedding or a, a property contract, the two halves becoming tallies needed to be held by each party to the agreement for it to remain functional. These are literal embodied symbols in action, pieces combined to generate significance. In the film, she transports the viewer to an imaginary utopian future where the act of restoration is underway to preserve and tend to a complete catalog of earthly artifacts. This is a very Borgesian as well as Warburgian piece. Price wishes to bring art to the work of redress or resistance, as in El Eliot's celebrated line, these fragments I have shored against my ruins. Her narrators, a chorus of ungendered voices, speak in a cybernetic automated recording, like the new voice active and extremely eerie Google bot. We are therefore placed in a timeline, time zone, sorry, we're therefore placed in a time zone far ahead, looking back on the most ancient times past. And this temporal mobility is Cassandra-like, knowing both the future and the past, and it envelops us through the flattening and folding and mirroring of the visual images. Elizabeth Price has just opened, literally last week, in Manchester at the Whitworth Gallery, an exhibition she's curated on the entirely Warburgian theme of the reclining figure. In states of weariness, sleep, stupor, reverie, grief, sickness, death, and erotic transport or languor. I haven't seen it yet because it literally opened, I couldn't have gone. Um, the show has the title, In a Dream You Saw a Way to Survive and You Were Full of Joy. This is a quotation from Barbara Kruger, the artist, and it is saturated, I think, with that fearful and apotropaic irony we recognize in the situation of Cassandra. But I'm going to try to weave to this Warburgian influence in contemporary art into another pattern, as I said at the start. And I'm taking my cue from Warburg's passion to touch, animate, to touch animate dynamic energy in the mimesis of motion. And turn now to the concept, but turn back again to the concept of the arabesque. A dynamic mode of its own, with a special significance in the age of mass diaspora, global networks, and digitization. The arabesque is strongly reappearing in contemporary culture for the same reasons that Jonas and Price seek to anticipate and avert further harm. The figural mimicry involved in an attempt to act magically upon the future takes different forms in interaction with the objects of imitation and in the hopes invested in the performance or representation. The Hopi dance to possess the spirit of the antelope. They entangled themselves with serpents. These animals belonged to a history to, in the story of relations between themselves and the world in which they needed and hoped to survive. But Warburg it identified another element in the object of imitation besides the characters in the story. Indeed, he explicitly searched within the narrative myths and legends to plumb the energy flowing within the nerves and sinews of the story body. Michaud discusses how, um, sorry, uh, Michaud discussing his, uh, Warburg's uh, essay on the Botticelli Primavera um, comments that we, Warburg, Warburg wished to pulverize the mechanisms of iconographic transmission from within in order to bring out the enigmatic function of the representation of motion, the manifestation of a body irreducible to meaning. According to these two principles of symbolic action in mind, magical wishfulness and figural mimicry, structures in story making and fictional artifacts are filled with an analogous desire to act upon the world through art and an analogous quest for dynamic, motile and effective significance. To achieve this in the digitalized world, the complex multidimensional forms, lattices and fractal symmetries have taken over from the column and the cube as structures invested with desirable power. And I noticed from many of the lectures that I, we've, we've been attending that actually the classical order is used rather pejoratively by Warburg in his Builder Atlas. Classical order colonnades and straight, straight, straight lines. I'm proposing that the arabesque is no mere ornamental doodle, doodle anymore, but a key expressive mode in the digital age. 
It describes a position in dance, as you all know, which comes in numerous variations, but usually involves a sense that the body is reaching out in space, extending the leg and rotating the limbs as it were to describe a vortex at the widest circumference the limbs can describe. It is also both a movement and a pose, a point of suspension. It cannot really be held at all long, and a snapshot of a whirl stopped, freeze-framed. It synthesizes polarity of a single body in space and counterposes grace to gravity, lightness and airiness to weight and mass. It is a supreme act of balance, skilled and, um, and vulnerable at once. Why does the word arabesque apply to the pose? Perhaps the pose describes a curve in 3D and extends the limbs, as I said, to the fullest extent possible in equilibrium. The word only appears as a term in ballet in English in 1828, according to the OED. But it can be applied retrospectively to convey supreme stretching, arching, and balancing of the body in space, an arrested movement in the course of a dance as if in a still image, a Dionysiac pose for a sculpture or a bas relief, fully charged with kinetic potential, with the grace of the nympha fluida in motion, the menad in ecstasy. Uh, this is a very contemporary menad, <laughs> Jacqueline Lorbal, um, in her, not in her, when, she, when uh, she was performing in a nightclub. It is very important to the wider meaning of the arabesque that Warburg's analysis of movement in 1893 turned into a study of the animist belief that carried the work of art. As a term in aesthetics, the arabesque enters Western European languages nearly 200 years earlier, in 1656. The term was transposed from the visual sphere to the lexicon of ballet without friction because arabesque designs possess propulsive, irrepressible kinetic qualities. The combined effects of arabesque Profusion, improvisatory exuberance, dynamic efflorescence are more usually found in visual expressions rather than Calvino's literary usage. The OED gives us its principal meaning, a decorative pattern consisting of flowing lines, typically of branches, leaves, and flowers that scroll or interlace. Also as a mass noun, decoration or ornamentation employing patterns of this type and the first example, which dates to 15, 1656, as I said, invokes painting and significantly tapestry. The dynamics of the aesthetic contain two dominant impulses. The spring or jet, uh, al-rami in Arabic, used for the flow and energy of water, and alongside this fluidity, a concept of constraint, al-kai in Arabic, meaning the lace as in shoelaces or other ties for clothing, a thong or a bond. The spurt and jet of flowing water is contained and held in a lattice, a web, or a net in order to produce the characteristic plural forms. Although the mode has affinities with the labyrinth, the infinite Borgesian form of it, and with the spider's web, water's fluidity and force and the properties of tying and binding are themselves in themselves endless and centerless. The border or frame is necessary to tether the generative exuberance. In, the dictionary, in their Dictionary of Symbols, the lexicographers Chevalier and Gilbrandt define it as not a figuration, but a rhythm, an incantation by indefinite repetition of the theme. It is unappeasingly directed, but in vain, towards the limitless. And I would say that that's a, a quest for, for energy to be constantly renewed. And they add the crucial remark that it transcribes, one could say, um, attempts to transcribe a heightened mental state. Dikir in Arabic is the metaphysical, even mystical term, meaning the contemplation and remembrance of holy things. Figure and ground become, even become interchangeable, tensely contracted. There is no foreground or background and nothing in between because what lies in between is of interest and may even flip into salience, depending on the onlooker's choice. The overall pattern may have no center at all, or circle around several centers, which keep shifting to the periphery as another cluster or arrangement compels attention. Such fullness sets up a figurative defense against meaninglessness and marginality. Nothing is valueless in this vision. The um, characteristic stucco vaults of Islamic architecture, called murkanas, structure the inner courts and walls of the Alhambra. 
and in, it, in Europe, um, the, the ceiling, uh, sorry, also in Europe, the Palatine Chapel in Palermo, where the Norman king, Roger II, employed Arab artists. And they take their cue from organic forms in three dimensions, such as shells, coral reefs, honeycombs, wasps' nests, and coral branching. The precise term arabesque, used in French as well as in English, that first enters French in the late 17th century, does so during the wave of enthusiasm that brought oriental modes of dress, design, and storytelling to Europe. The first print edition of the Arabian Nights, for example, appears in 1704 in the French translation of Antoine Galland, Les Milieux Nuits. The English anonymous version followed swiftly after. This era also saw the building of the great urban fortifications during the wars of Louis XIV, designed by the king's engineer, Sébastien Le Prêtre de Vauban, who isolated cellular clusters and constellations to erect bastions and ramparts. The scholar Joan de Jean, or perhaps Joan de Jean, I don't know how she pronounces her name, in a remarkably bold article on the early modern novel, points out that at the very same time as Vauban was denaturing the arabesque by interrupting its rhythmic plenitude and repetition to create fortresses, the modern novel was taking on its distinctive role as prime cartographer of the heart and psyche and society. Robinson Crusoe on his island is deeply concerned with fortresses, as and in Tristram Shandy by Laurence Stern, very popular in France, as Robert Danton showed us yesterday, Uncle Toby obsessively models a replica of the siege of Namur in 1695, a fortress which Vauban himself had strengthened for that conflict. De Jean declares that the original space of the early modern novel, the space of the novel's origin, is the fortress. Uncle Toby, as he responds to the widow Wagman's amorous inquisitiveness, with ever more elaborate renderings of the citadel's trenches and bastions and other defenses, reproduces this tension between the strong fixed place and the vagaries and flows of energetic desire and Stern prolonging his reader's amusement by enclosing this scene of erotic struggle within a novel that meanders and effloresces with exhilarating profusion and insouciance. Sorry, Stern prolongs his reader's amusement. The women writers in France who led the way for modern fiction in France, précieuses like Mademoiselle de Scudéry of Clélie and Madame de Lafayette of La Princesse de Clèves, mapped an alternative topography with patterns of movement and resistance, variant strongholds and different concepts of boundaries and safe enclaves. Um, Georgine comments, Scudéry's terre inconnue, unknown territories, would therefore be a utopian no man's land, a non-place or a place in fiction where women can protect the female heart by controlling representations of it and denying men access to the language that expresses it. The novel was to act as the new map of women's desires. It constructed in imagination a terrain to be wandered over, to be tracked by different means, civility rather than military assault. An aesthetic philosophy such as Warburg's that is committed to the autonomy of an artifact and to the vitality of images similarly unfolds an alternative cartography in order to oppose hierarchies of value and assertions of power. Certain structural features of narrative hyperbolic repetition, grayscale reproduction in poor and blurry quality, profusion and confusion of plotting binary modes such as doubling and mirroring, and fertile constellations and meanders, irresistible play with the toys in the toy chest, or of imagery and language, all contribute to dissolving the Vaudin-like ramparts and walls. However, alongside the efflorescent structures, the motive force propelling the energies of the arabesque as developed in Islam, derives from writing, from the word embodied in ink, paint, metal, ceramics, marbles, textiles. Any medium can carry the word. The curling tendrils, uh, burgeoning fronds, and the winding stems of natural forms metamorphose into letters, not to be intelligible, but to add power to the image of the word inscribed. Praises, blessings, talismans, protective charms, and official signatures. These are powerful verbal formulae rendered into image. This is amuletic opaque function in action, warding off dangers, active in stories that tell of the power of spells and also speak themselves to bless and curse and prophesy. Script 
even frequently becomes interwoven with the very fabric of architecture, incorporating the power of the knotted and interlaced word into the sacred enclave's outer walls, a blazon, but also a cartography of preferred values made visible. The work of the anthropologist Alfred Gell in um, Cambridge in the 1990s can throw light on the significance of arabesque complexity. Gell formulated the useful phrase, art as agency, for an art that set out to intervene in the world and make things happen. Art is made in a variety of ways, he continued, in order to assure the survival of the society or group. Um, and in his important book, Art and Agency, Gell argues that the methods anthropologists use to understand the meaning of art and aesthetics in a culture that is not their or ours should be extended to, that is not, sorry, that is not ours, should be extended to explore contemporary practice at home. Artifacts are, as inst are instruments made in order to exert influence, either to make something happen, assure health, fertility, luck in love, wealth, cleanse of pollution, or to stop things happening, prevent death, destroy enemies, ward off nightmares, avert revenge, or to tell a history, a, a story of a people's history and relations to existence. He developed his theory from fieldwork he did in Papua New Guinea and among the Maori of New Zealand, looking at the ways they deployed myths and stories to define themselves in visual narratives which they invested with magical powers to ensure themselves against attack and to inflict damage on their enemies. But he added himself into the picture and criticized the methodological atheism expected of his profession, which entailed leaving the meaning of beliefs to the theologians with moral and philosophical consequences. In the spirit of Warburg, I think, he then went on to ask what would happen if aesthetics were approached in a similar way, that art was not primarily considered an expression of the higher beauty and truth, but incorporated into the central processes of society and seen, like the religious faith of Papuan tribes, as a network of social relations operating as a form of collective action to secure the safety of the group. The intricate involutions of Maori facial tattooing and the elaborately coiled carvings on the prows of the canoes they used to go into battle were riddling images, Gale argued, devised to baffle and repel hostile forces. The interlacings and complexity designed to trammel any oncomer to catch them in their nets. The vertiginous vortices of Arabic structures correspond, I would suggest, with the magical purposes that Warburg re recognized in the Hopi serpent dance. They are summonses by mimicry of transcendent and invisible forces which can offer protection. They express powerful knowledge, designs to act upon the world. So complicated are the permutations of the structures, they can't be easily committed to memory, and it's a paradox of both visual arabesque and oral transmission that patterns are needed to imprint the memory but they often aspire to such inventive multiplicity that they are, in effect, rendered ungraspable, secret, and therefore all the more efficacious. I'll just skip the next two. I'm afraid I can't. They're too much. They're magical talismans of writing. And I'll go to the last piece. Um, the abstraction of arabesque did not perhaps offer itself to Warburg, as far as I can tell, because its time had not yet come to communicate the illuminations he desired with such anguish. But discoveries since Warburg's time have established arabesque generativity, mirroring and symmetries, interconnectivity and propulsion as a remarkable prophecy of vital invisible structures of organisms and consciousness. The artist duo Alan Al are masters of the latest digital systems and questers into the interactions of consciousness with them. In their recent films, this uncanny artist duo have made together, one called The Creator and The Demiurge. They give vertiginous glimpses of the edgeless, curving multiplicity of time and space at the macrocosmic dimension and the vortices of cellular biology at the microcosmic or even the quantum field. Alan Turing embodies the artist's own intimation of that unity and the hopes that the vast incomprehensibility of creation will yield to the perseverance of their craft to make the wonders of matter visual, visible. Their visuals also delight in discovering infinite rapports, doublings, and patterning macrocosmic cosm forms at a microcosmic scale. The computer-generated fractals they unfurl give the viewer similar vertiginous vistas of cellular lattices and vortices, 
biomorphic shapes swelling and undulating, planes curving and recurving over themselves, Piranesian perspectives of intersecting arcs, and Escher-like, mind-bending, multidimensional puzzles. Um, so finally, um, so I think Narabe's structures no longer seem to be decorative in any degraded or marginal sense. They reproduce a potential different organizational system of political and social coexistence, interconnection and entanglement. Um, the most recent and most beautiful example, I think, are the new mathematical buildings in Oxford's uh, marble floor, or stone floor, um, in which Roger, for which Ron, Roger Penrose has generated his most uh, infinite tiling. There is no repeat in this, over any, no imaginable repeat over any um, extended distance. It actually constantly repeats, but always with variations. The interlacings of narrative and visual patterns um, Re, re, to reactivate the energies that flow through them in response to any number of aggressive forces of destruction. The Iranian-born artist Shirazi Hushiari, who moved to London in 1974, recently gave this, this answer to a newspaper asking about the referendum we are facing. She said, the world is developing and changing and we have to slowly remove boundaries. The fact that we want to go backwards and return to what we were in the past is not growth. This will be bad for creativity, bad for science. It is bad for every single individual. It is better to develop and have a different kind of consciousness that connects us to other people. Thank you.